My background, I think, uh, you know, as you kind of alluded to, is in, in physics. So most of my career up until the late 90s was spent in high energy physics. And I, I don't know if I had an epiphany or a revelation or what, but I decided that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in biology. So I sort of did a, a bit of a phase transition and kind of, you know, went into uh, biology and biotechnology. So I've been sort of happily in that world ever since. Are we still in the heyday of this? Are we still, at, are we at the beginning of this bio generation or the ability to do what you do? Um, I think it's probably something like, you know, where quantum, what physics was back in the 1920s, where people were, you know, really understanding how things worked at a very fundamental level, you know, physical principles and quantum mechanics. And um, we're kind of going through that now, I think that since the 1970s, roughly up through now, and, and I don't think the story is really over. It'll probably be another, you know, 50 to 100 years of, of interesting work. Where is, um, I'm just, I'm curious what, you had said you just had this phase shift, but I'm I'm always interested in the spark that made that change. When when you change and said, "Man, it's about biology." I want to take this brain and and point it at that problem. Sure, you know, physics is really all about reductionism, trying to understand the fundamental constituents of nature and the interactions between them, how that all works. Uh, whereas biology is way on the other side of the spectrum. It's very much about complexity and how how very, very complex systems, this arguably the most complex systems work. Um, and you don't have to understand things at sort of the atomistic level, but you have to have a level of complexity that you can deal with. You know, you have to have an abstraction. Um, and we've been able to do that by, by looking at, at, you know, um, biology as sort of a, a, you know, consortium of lots of very exotic little, you know, machines and mechanisms working together. There's, um, when I was reading uh, about your work, you, you say that modifying uh, microbial and plant animal cells ha has been slow and artisanal. And the word artisanal made me think of artisanal wines or craft grapes and jams and jellies. <laughs> it is like, that's not it. What do, what do you mean by artisanal in this context? Um, well, I, you know, also in the subtitle of the talk, I mentioned, you know, organism making and modding, and and uh, that might seem a little artisanal too, because the makers and the modders I'm thinking of are people like at the Makers Fair who are making sure. something extraordinary out of something simple, or the mo hot rod modders who are making like a, you know, a, turning a Dodge Dart into a dragster. Um, so there's a little bit of both, but but what's happened over the net last 30 years is that our tools, our ability to modify microbes and to manipulate them and bend them to our will, if you will, has just increased so much. Um, the tools and the techniques are just amazing now. Um, and I don't think we've seen the end of that story either. It's just gonna get better and better. Is this a, a general field of research now that we, whereas before it was at a few spots, sounds like you worked at all of those spots. It, are we finding the research more distributed? Well, I mean, it really comes out of, you have to go back to sort of the birth of modern biotechnology with, you know, Boyer and Cohen at Stanford and uh, at UCSF and Stanford and the development of recombinant methods which sort of set the stage for everything we're doing now. And, and that ability to clone genes like immediately fractured into different disciplines in the industrial world, industrial biotech and biopharma. And then of course, famously genetic engineering of plants. And it's kind of been running along those threads ever since. If that makes sense. What what's an area? I'm the one question comes to mind is what's an area where you guys are working that might surprise us? Um, well, I think we you know we started by talking about you know the bio-based economy, what that means. I don't think I really answered that question. What what we're, what the bio-based economy really means is that for things like fabrics, mm. food, pharmaceuticals, um, fuels. You're all going to start with um, sort of precursors or feedstocks that are natural or bio-based, rather than deriving everything from you know the barrel of oil to get your hydrogens and your carbons. You're going to be doing it, uh, you know, through biological sources, um, and those those feedstocks, those things can drive entire industries, like an entire chemical industry can be based now instead of you know a petrochemical. It can be based on you know, biologically derived material. 
So let me see if I've got this right, because I was talking with a guy a few weeks ago who's working on um, industrial hemp. And mm -hmm. part of what he said is, and that's a feedstock, I think. Yeah. And using that to, uh, as a plastic, the fibers for making what we call plastic, it's not plastic, but it's it serves that purpose. Right, and there's two forks to that. So there's there's taking a bio-based material that, that is close to what we need for the us humans, and then just running with it and using it, which is like most of human history, right? And right, then there's right. a fork that branches off from that starting in 1970s, which says, now I know so much about how these organisms work and I can manipulate them that I can direct uh, this organism to make something that's much closer to what I would want to replace, you know, say a petrochemical, with, you know, carbon. So we dump a lot of carbon in the air and, and, you know, steel production accounts for, you know, like a huge percent, like five to 7% of global greenhouse gases. And what happens in steel production is you just flare off the carbon oxide that's produced in steel production and becomes CO2, otherwise a poisonous gas. So right. you're seeing these big flare pipes that are just flaring off poisonous gas. Well, what you can do now is you can take that otherwise poisonous carbon monoxide, pipe it through a fermenter, which is a lot like fermenting beer, um, but you're fermenting a very specific microbe that really loves to eat carbon monoxide. And it can then use that carbon monoxide that would otherwise be a waste gas, a greenhouse gas, and make useful products. So that's just one example of many. Is that working at scale now, or is that still in the lab? No, they have they have these giant fermenters. They're three story tall fermenters sitting next to Chinese steel mills, and uh, yeah, instead of flaring the off gas, they pipe them through these fermenters and and produce ethanol. So one of our group tries to help companies like that not only produce ethanol um, but also produce other high value chemicals. One of the things, so this may this you kind of opened my mind to hey there can be a biological replacement for things and one of the challenges i know we have is in battery production and mining things like lithium is there a bio battery there's that's the question i finally got the question out is there a bio-based battery um you can make very not very efficient batteries out mm. of out of you know, monolayers of cells and so forth. I don't think that's a particularly good solution for the very high energy densities that you need for a battery. So I think, you know, you know in the near and long term, you're going to need, you know, these high energy density batteries to really kind of support that kind of uh, thing. Um, just coincidentally, though, there there <laughs> there are people working on bio mining. So there are microbes. Oh, what's that? that? I don't know too much about it, but there are microbes that will basically, you know, um, attach themselves to metals. So you can actually help leach um, metals huh. out of tailings using microbes. Of course, this is interesting to people like the Chileans who have these, you know, huge ponds full of tailings and so forth. They're trying to detoxify. Right. Interesting. Uh, one of the things that that seems to come up, and there was a TED. Uh, summit conversation about this was the ethics around genetic uh, manipulation. I'm curious, does that conversation happen when we're just talking about humans and cloning and that kind of thing, and kind of people don't care as much if it's with plants or other animals that are not human? Can you help us understand that debate? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're a very egotistical species, so of course the closer it is us, the <laughs> more worried we are about it, and you know, rightfully so. Um, so, so when you're talking about genetic human engineering or or things of that nature, um, even using you know genetically engineered um, T cells, for example, to fight cancer, people do have legitimate concerns over, you know, how is that research done and how it, how will it affect me and my health. Um, when you, you can get one step away from that and say, well, I'm, I'm genetically modifying a crop or a plant in order to better you know, resist uh, pesticides or insects. And that way I don't have to till the soil and it reduces runoff, it reduces the use of artificial fertilizer. Um, but I'm eventually gonna eat that genetically modified organism. Right. So that's right. close to humans too. So we, we worry about that as well. Then you get one step farther away when you're producing a cancer or life-saving drug that's been genetically modified. I mean, most of the most of the drugs we take that aren't small molecules are basically, you know, come from GMOs. Um, but, but you know, if it's going to save your life, you're happy to take that 
that drug. And then even one stop farther away is the industrial biotech use that I just alluded to, where you just got a fermenter with a bunch of microbes eating carbon monoxide. Yeah, that's all good, you know? Yeah, so I, yeah. I think it really depends on how close you are to, to the human. That's Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm reminded, I keep my, all my references to this world come from the TED stage. Um, <laughs> and they, they wheeled out 16, look like library carts full of these binders that were very, very, very large. And it was solid. And, and they had printed out a DNA sequence. Mm -hmm. And apparently, I mean, it took up the whole stage. And they opened up one of the books and it was just characters with no spaces for, you know, 1000 pages per book. And there was, I don't know how many linear feet of those books. And the part that um, is intriguing to me is you only need one of those pairs to be wrong for there to be a problem. I think that speaks to what you said earlier about the complexity of this field you're in. Yeah, that's that's a kind of a beautiful representation of the size of the human genome. And, and yeah, and then conversely, a single nucleotide sort of switch can give you sickle cell anemia. Right. Um, right. So actually those, those types of diseases where it's a single nucleotide sort of swap um, are the ones that people are most interested in attacking with these new technologies that, that you know, Jennifer Doudna and, and um, Charpentier have developed for gene editing because it sounds tractable. It says all I have to do is go modify, you know, one, one nucleotide. There are others that are, you know, multi-gene type of diseases that are much more difficult to attack. But yeah, the first ones people will go after are those ones that, you know, are single, they call them polymorphisms, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It's just a swap, you know? Right. So one of the things that we, we talk about a lot, by the way, for those TED, T-E-D, the T stands for technology. We're deep into that today. Um, I, I'm curious about the role of AI in your work, because it sounds like just that genomic sequence we were talking about, there's tremendous amount of data that you're dealing with on a regular basis. How does AI help you? How has it helped you? Um, so I'm going to try to back up a little bit here because the typical example or use case for AI and say, you know, we're talking about DNA, lots of DNA in a genome is that, oh, that's a lot of data. Therefore, AI might be useful because you, you need a lot of data to train a, a machine learning model or an, an AI algorithm. But let's back up for just a second. Um, what I think the, what I think is a new and exciting use of AI is not necessarily combing through lots of sequences looking for things, which is a, a valid use for it, but using artificial intelligence to proactively say, how am I going to, how am I going to better build this drug, right? How am I better going to build or modify this microbe so it does what I want? Um, and, and this is where AI is particularly well suited, I think, because um, with AI, you have an input, and then you have a black box, and then you have an output. Um, in biology, you have an input, which is the genome, the DNA sequence. You have a black box, which is biology. And then you have the output, which is what they call the phenotype or the physical manifestation of what that uh, genotype leads to, you know, whether it's, you know, blue eyes or whatever. So, so it's very difficult to model in a physics sense what goes on inside that black box to associate genotype with phenotype. However, that's the kind of problem machine learning was really designed for, you know? Yeah. I don't know exactly, you know, why this thing looks like a cat, but, you know, train the neural net and it'll find cats on the internet. And I don't know exactly why this is a good, you know, microbial pathway to tweak in this particular way, but it is. So let's, let's learn that. Let's train a model based on that. And so that's the sense that I think is exciting for the use of machine learning and AI in the next you know, 50 years is how to actually proactively go and build something. If that makes sense. Mike, I'm going to uh, stay, stay tuned to the Mike Farrow channel uh, for, for exciting developments. This is uh, so far extremely exciting. 